morning, everybody. Thanks for coming along to this night upon Israel. You might feel a bit affronted to see blue and white balloons and us celebrating the state of Israel because you might say, well, how can you celebrate? There's all those people died in Gaza yesterday. 57 of them, was it? Awful. Yes, I agree. It was awful. And tonight, we just want to focus for a few minutes on what the Bible might say about this issue. So we don't really care about Trump's plans or Mr Netanyahu's goals or what the President of France, Mr Macron, might say or the President of Syria, Mr Assad, or indeed Julie Bishop, our own Foreign Minister. Tonight we're going to set all those to one side and all we want to find out is what does God think? Now you would say, you're a very arrogant man. You can tell me what God thinks. Well, I don't want to tell you what God thinks. I want to open the Bible and read some passages and give you some explanation of those passages. And you tell me if I'm reading those passages in a reasonable manner. And I think these passages will tell a story. We've read a long passage from Ezekiel 36. Tonight, I won't ask you to read too many passages. I'll read them for you. But hopefully, we can understand what's going on. Why, what's this all about? Well, what's the 70 years? On the 14th of May, 1948, Israel was declared a state. And it was called the State of Israel. 70 years ago, yesterday. And, of course, the Palestinians are having a protest tomorrow when they protest the formation of this state. We're not going to go through all of that history of what happened simply to say it was an incredible thing. And we'll talk about that a little tonight. And, you know, I hear some Aussies saying, oh, no, Israel shouldn't exist. Well, you know what happened in 1947 at the United Nations. They had a vote about the state of Israel and Australia being near the top of the alphabet, we put our hands up and said, yes, yes for Israel. So it's a bit hard 70 years later to pull our hand down and say, no, we don't support Israel anymore. And an Australian, Doc Evert, was the president of the United Nations. So, you know, Australia's had a big part in this story. Well, what, sorry, indeed, is going on. Trump is going to make Israel great. That, that building is the USA consulate in Jerusalem, which yesterday, Jared Kushner and Donald Trump's daughter, Ivanka, declared was now an embassy. And nearby, they have a building site in which they're going to build a new embassy for USA. USA will be the only one that has its embassy in Jerusalem. Australia has its embassy in Tel Aviv. But this is what generated all the protests. So out on the streets of Gaza, the protesters came and Hamas bust protesters to the fence that they might um, raise a protest against Israel, which turned into bloodshed. And we won't go on the rights and wrongs. The other side of the fence... The Israelis in the bottom corner there are celebrating the 70th anniversary of their state. Now, they actually celebrated it a month ago because they follow the Jewish calendar, not the Western calendar. So they had their big celebration, but for us in the West, yesterday marks the day. And, of course, it's been accompanied by terrible fighting as the Israeli forces, armed forces are fighting back against the people of Gaza. Now, last week was also a very eventful week because last week the Iranians from their bases in Syria started to throw a few missiles in Israel's direction and Israel sent lots of missiles back. And it was claimed by some experts that Israel had sort of taken out a lot of the Iranian capability within the area of Syria. And this is another thing we should watch because it seems that it is possible that it's heating up to war between Iran and Israel. 
will wait. God has it all in his plan. How many people here have actually been to Jerusalem? Yes, a few people. It's been my pleasure to be there twice. And Jerusalem is a key place in the Bible. It's a key place in God's purpose. The prophet Jeremiah told the people of Israel when they were in captivity, he said, whatever ha happens to you when you're captives, let Jerusalem come to mind. Always think about this city of Jerusalem. Don't forget it. Now I want to quote you an important verse about Jerusalem in the Bible. It's from Matthew chapter 5, from the teaching of Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Jerusalem is the city of the great king. What's Jesus claiming? He's telling us, Jerusalem is my city. I am the great king, not, not a minor king. I am the great king, and Jerusalem is my city. So does that answer the question? Does Jerusalem belong to the Palestinians or the Israelis? The answer is to neither. The city belongs to Jesus Christ. And he's coming back to claim the city which he told the people of his day in the Sermon on the Mount was the city of the great king. Well, at this point, you might be feeling a bit uncomfortable. You might say, I hate Israel. I hate the Jews. I got a woman in the next building. I know she hates the Jews because she's always sending out emails supporting the Palestinians. But I don't go and have fisty cuffs with her. I understand she hates Israel. And her claims against Israel, they are cruel to the Palestinians. Oh, yeah, the Palestinians do bad things, but they use what's called disproportionate response. They respond very harshly against the Palestinians. I hate Israel. They are arrogant. Well, I've met some arrogant Jews in Israel, but I've met some very nice Jews in Israel. Some, we went into their house for dinner. They are like any race. As a, as a race, they are very confident people. They are very capable people. And there's no doubt that people can get a sense that they're overconfident. I hate Israel, they're belligerent. They always want to fight people. But I don't think they really want to fight people. Certainly, most Israelis want peace as much as anybody else in the world. Do you think they really enjoy living in a state of turmoil and problems all the time? Well, whatever th we think about Israel, 4,000 years ago, in the scriptures, God expressed his opinion. And his opinion was spoken to a man called Abraham. And interestingly, this man Abraham is claimed by both the Jews and the Palestinians as their father. Right? And we won't go into the complexities of that. But whether you read the Koran or the Bible, these people trace themselves back to Abraham. But this is what God said about the people who would eventually become the people of Israel. And Israel was the name of the grandson of Abraham. Abraham had a son called Isaac, who had a son called Israel. So Israel is Abraham's grandson. This is what God said to this man. Abraham, I want you to be very obedient to me. I want you to go to a country. I'm going to show you. I'm not going to tell you where you're going to go, but I'm going to take you somewhere, and I want you to believe in me and go to this country, which Abraham did. When he got there, he found his land, which is called in those days Canaan, which we today call Israel. And God said, if you're obedient to me, Abraham, I will give you this country that I'm going to take you to, and I'm going to be kind and bless your descendants. And Abraham, I will bless the people who bless you. I will show love and kindness to the people who show love and kindness back to you. But I will curse him who curses you. The person who is 
fighting and combative and against you, God says, I will be against you. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We say, in Abraham, who was in the Middle East, do we see this as the region of worldwide blessing? No. It's a problem place, isn't it? Whether you look at Syria or Iran or Israel, wherever you turn, it's a place of problems. But you see, God doesn't change his mind. When he decided he would work with these people in Israel, that was it. It wasn't based on whether they were nice people, whether they were kind people, whether they were good people, it was based on his choice of these people. So I want to just quote you some words from the New Testament, and this is from the book of Romans, written by the great follower of Christ called the Apostle Paul. And in Romans 9 to 11, he speaks a lot about these people of Israel. And he says in verse 28, about the Jewish people concerning the gospel concerning the good news that Christ brought they are enemies for your sakes well why are Jews enemies of the gospel well they're enemies says Paul writing this passage because God has put the Jews to one side for a while and today he's calling us the non-Jews Perhaps you are a Jew, but I assume most of us are non-Jews. So today, God is calling us non-Jews, what's called in the Bible Gentiles, to be part of his purpose. So they're like enemies. They're on one side for the time being. But concerning the election, the call of God, they're beloved. And they're beloved for the sake of of the fathers. Who's these fathers? Well, it's very clear when you read Paul's writings, the fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. So they are loved because of Abraham, not because of their personality, not because of the way they behave, but because of Abraham. And he finishes this with the last lines you can see on the screen. The gifts of God, the calling of God, are irrevocable. You know, God says to the prophet Malachi, I am the Lord, I do not change. If I say I'm going to work with these people, Israel, I will. And in fact, the section of Romans I'm reading from starts off with a question in... uh, Chapter, this chapter 11 I've been reading from, verse 1 says, has God cast away the Jews? Is it possible that because of their wickedness and their murdering of his son Jesus, that he's cast them away? And the answer by the Apostle Paul is certainly not. No, he has not cast away the Jews. The gifts of God to his people The calling of God of the nation of Israel and of Abraham is irrevocable. I'm sure you understand that word. It doesn't change. God won't change his mind. He's not giving up on these people. Yes, they said about Jesus, away with him, kill him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. But God is still working with these people today. So if we go back Three and a half thousand years ago, God made amazing prophecies through Moses, the man who gave the Jews their law. Amazing prophecies about the future of this race. And I just want to read a few things that God said would happen to his people. It shall come upon you when all these things come, the blessing and the curse, you will call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord thy God had driven thee. I am telling you, says Moses, you are God's people. You're about to go into this land of Israel. But I'm telling you, one day you're going to be scattered. You're going to be taken out of this land. 
you're going to be punished because you're going to disobey God. But one day, you will return unto God and obey his voice. And God will have compassion of you. And if your outcast be in the uttermost parts of heaven, your God will gather you and fetch you and bring you, verse 5, into the land which your fathers possessed. So I tell you, you'll be scattered, but God will draw you back to the land which your fathers possessed. And you can find this same theme in many other parts of the Old Testament. Oh yes, I will punish you, my people, but one day I will bring you back. So take these words from the prophet Jeremiah. I don't know whether you've heard of the prophet Jeremiah, but he lived about 600 years before Jesus. And he spoke to them just before the Babylonians were going to come down and destroy Jerusalem, their city. And they all hated Jeremiah because he kept saying, Jerusalem will be taken over by the Babylonians. Said, no, never going to happen. Jerusalem is our city forever. And Jeremiah said, no, it's going to be taken. So if I can read to you some words from Jeremiah chapter 16. And in the 13th verse, God says to his people, I am going to cast you out of this land, this land of Israel, into a land that you do not know, neither you nor your fathers. And there you shall serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favour. I'm going to throw you out of your land, says God. Verse 14. But the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall come to pass, that they will no more say, Oh, God, the God of Israel, didn't he bring his people out of Israel in the Exodus? I don't know if you've heard of the Exodus story. There's been many films and other things made about it. When Israel lived in Egypt as slaves and God brought them out with great power. Well, he says, I brought Israel out of Egypt. But one day, people won't talk about that anymore. But in verse 15, they'll talk about the God who brought the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he has driven them, and bring them back to the land which I gave to their fathers. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this recurring phrase, the fathers, the fathers, the fathers, because what matters is what God promised to Abraham 4,000 years ago, that he would be with his descendants and make them a great nation as he promised them. I'm going to bring them back to their land, which I gave to their fathers. And I will work hard, says God. I will be like a fisherman fishing them for them and like a hunter hunting for them, says God. But God says, I will repay them double for their sins. Oh yes, I'm going to punish these people for their wickedness, but I will bring them back to their own land. And tonight I want to show you a number of passages that clearly illustrate this purpose of God. He had it in his intention that the Jews would be scattered into many countries but be brought back. Thank you. Jews came to Palestine and the UN General Assembly passed a fateful plan to divide up Palestine into independent Arab and Jewish states. As the war call began, the proceedings were momentarily interrupted. A piercing cry came from the gallery. Anna Adonai Hoshi Anna. Oh Lord, please save us. The United States? Yes? Yemen? No? The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstention. The stage was set. On the afternoon of May 14th, several council members met to approve the final draft of the declaration. The text was approved unanimously. 
but just hours before it would be read, the new state still didn't have a name. Historical names like Zion and Judea were proposed and rejected. It was Ben-Gurion who decided that the name would be simply Medinat Israel, the State of Israel. Despite the instructions for secrecy, the news had leaked out and a large crowd gathered outside the museum. Jewish leaders were now racing the sunset to finish the ceremony before the Sabbath began at 5 o'clock. At 4 p.m., David Ben-Gurion called the meeting to order. The crowd rose and sang Hatikva. Then Ben-Gurion read the declaration aloud. President Truman recognized the new state of Israel just 11 minutes after the British mandate officially ended. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. He was cheering in the streets, it was a big thing, dancing in the streets and all this, and he was standing in the back there. He says, what well, the people are dancing here, what they don't know, is tomorrow we've got a war. So we could watch that footage all night. Exciting scenes in Israel 70 years ago yesterday with the birth of the Jewish nation. But we want to now move on and say, well, how can we be so sure that this was God's plan? Now, I want to refer you to the chapter that Matt read at the beginning of our evening from Ezekiel chapter 36. And you saw that verse from Ezekiel 36 flash onto the screen. And in Ezekiel 36, God says to his people, the nations are going to possess your land. Verse 3 of Ezekiel 36. The nation said, we made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, God says in verse 5, I will speak in my burning jealousy and I will pour out my fury against the nations which have taken your land. But you, verse 8, you people of Israel, you will shoot forth like a tree. And it was Jesus in Luke 21 who picked that, that, that idea and said, when Israel shoots forth like a fig tree, you know that my coming is very near. And he says to them, I am going to multiply men again in the land of Israel. Verse 10. And the city shall be inhabited. The ruins will be rebuilt. And if you ever have the privilege of going to Israel today, that's exactly what you'll see. Verse 20, verse 19, I scatter them, says God. Among the nations, they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them. I spread my people afar. And whenever they came to the nations, in verse 20, they profaned my holy name. And they said, well, these are God's people, but they're no longer in their land. But God says, look, I'm going to do something for you, Israel, but not for you. I'm going to do it because of my name, my reputation, my honour. God says, I'm going to do this. I will make my name honoured and hallowed. Verse 24, here's an important verse 
Let me just read it very clearly. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Now, I just didn't make up that I think that's about Israel re-establishing themselves in the 20th century in their own land. Christadelphians had believed this idea for 170 years. Before there were virtually any Jews in Israel, we have believed the unerring meaning of these verses, that Israel, the Jews, must go back to the land. I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. That's exactly what we have seen God fulfilling. He did it in the 1880s, the first Aaliyah, into the 1890s and so on, into the 20th century to the formation of the state 70 years ago yesterday. In verse 32, the prophet repeats the words of God. I'm not doing it for your sake, says the Lord God, do you understand, O house of Israel? I'm doing it for my holy nation. My holy name might be honoured in the earth. Let's go on then into Ezekiel 37. And the Jews know this prophecy very well. And what happens in Ezekiel 37? We'll come back to Ezekiel 36 right at the end. But Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel's taken out and God says, uh, Ezekiel, can you see all these skeletons? I said to my grandson the other day, do you think those skeletons can live? And he says, no, those skeletons can't live. Uh, and Ezekiel's looking at his skeletons and God says to him, he calls him son of man, he says, son of man, can these bones be alive again? And Ezekiel's answer in verse 3, I answered and said, O Lord God, you know, and he said, prophesy to these bones that I'm going to make these bones alive. Well, what are these bones? The prophet explains the picture that's going on. Verse 11. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. We're cut off, we're dead, we're dry, just like dry skeletons. We're not alive anymore, we're dead as dead as dead. Can these bones live? God says, yes. Verse 5, God says, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I'll put sinews on you, verse 6. I'll put flesh upon these dry skeletons. I'll put skin upon you and I'll breathe life into you and make you alive. So in verse 7, as Ezekiel's prophesying, he heard a rattling and all his skeletons came together. The bones, the pelvis, the vertebrae, all these dry, dry bones came together in verse 7. And then he saw his flesh was formed on the skeletons. And then he saw skin covering the flesh. And then he saw life being breathed into the skeletons. And in verse 9 he says, Come from the four winds, O breath. And the breath came into them, verse 10. They lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. What was Ezekiel seeing? He was seeing in a symbol, the rejuvenation, the rebuilding of the people of Israel. And over the last hundred years, we've seen this amazing prophecy being fulfilled. And there was a noise, or a voice, in verse 7. And as he heard this noise, this voice, the bones came together. And for the Jewish people, that noise or voice came from men like Theodore Herzl, who at the first Zionist Congress in Basel in 1897, as pictured on the left, stood up and encouraged his people. 
as we have, you might be able to read, by an odd twist of circumstances, the loudest and clearest voice calling the Jews together was a Budapest-born lawyer and journalist who at one time hadn't cared about the Jewish cause. He felt mass conversion to Christianity might be the answer so that there was no more anti-Semitism. And his book, The Jewish State, An Attempt at a Modern Solution of the Jewish Question, was published in Vienna in 1896. And he was to muse later on in Basel at the First Zionist Congress, I founded the Jewish State. He said maybe in five years, certainly in 50, everyone will realise it. What happened? 50 years after the voice spoke in 1897, by 1947, the United Nations is having a vote on the formation of the State of Israel. And Australia said yes. And the United States said yes. And Russia said yes, just to annoy the English. But one by one, all the countries put up their hand some for, the Arab bloc against, and many abstain. But it came into being. Why? Some freak accident that all these Jews from all over the world found their way back to Israel and formed a state? Was that just sheer accident? No, ladies and gentlemen, we would suggest to you that it's the fulfilment of the prophecies we've been reading tonight. Jeremiah 16. Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 37. So they came back to this land. Tel Aviv was just sand hills and they built a city. They grew vineyards. On the right, we have a picture of Carmel, the winery they established as they started their vineyards and made wine and grew oranges and rejuvenated. And they came back on ships from all over Europe to set up their own Jewish state. So there were sinews, people coming together and combining together, Jews coming back from all over the world. And the 12th verse of Ezekiel 37 is particularly important. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. How else do we describe the Holocaust? But the graves of six million Jews. But out of that, God brought these people back to their own land and brought them into the land of Israel. Am I concocting something? Or was this God's plan two and a half thousand years ago in the days of Ezekiel? Verse 14. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live said God to Israel, and I'll place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. He just didn't say it. He says, I'm not a God of words, I'm a God of action. I said I'd do this, and I'm doing it. And Ezekiel goes on to that. And he builds on this message in verse 21. Surely, Behold, I'll take the people of Israel from among the nations, from Argentina, from Poland, from America, from Ethiopia, from all these countries, from every country where you have been gone, scattered all over the world, an impossible thing. God said, I will gather you on every side and bring you into your own land. And he went on to say, I will make them one nation in the land of the mountains of Israel. Do you, did you watch, do you remember from the video, it's times running out. The Sabbath's about to commence. They have to declare the, the state and nobody knows what to call it. And Moshe, ben, David Ben-Gurion, gets up and says, oh, we're going to call it Israel. Well, staggering, wasn't it? Because God said, That's what they're going to call it, the mountains of Israel. They fulfilled exactly what the scriptures said. But you know, 
dear friends, we're only part way through. Verse 22. God's purpose is not complete. He says to them in verse 22, one king shall be king over them all. Now he wasn't talking about Benjamin Netanyahu. Who would this great king be to the people of Israel? Jesus. Yeah? The one who said in Matthew 5, don't swear by Jerusalem. It is the city of the great king. I am coming to be king over the city. They will no longer be divided into two nations. And Ezekiel spoken about how the Jews have been divided. They won't be divided anymore. They will be never divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. And Ezekiel goes on to say, in verse 25, they shall dwell in the land where your fathers dwell, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David, the beloved one, shall be their prince forever. Well, we all know who the beloved one is because if you know anything about Jesus when he was baptised, a voice from heaven said, this is the beloved one. And he's coming again to be their prince forever. That's the plan of God. That's the intention of the Almighty as we read it in the scriptures. Well, what's going to happen in Israel? Will Trump bring peace? Well, there may be some temporary peace in Israel. But the scriptures tell us that actually the problems will not be solved by Donald or Teresa or Malcolm, least of all, because there's only one person that can solve these problems, and his name is Jesus. But Zechariah 12 warns us that we must keep our eyes on Jerusalem because the problems are only going to get worse. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 3. God says, I am going to make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces. Oh yes, you want to get rid of the problem of Israel, get rid of the Jews? If you try and throw this heavy stone, what will happen to you is you'll get cut in pieces. Though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Now, that's important language. All nations of the earth be gathered against Israel. And Zechariah 14, the prophet, tells us that God says, one day all the nations of the world will be gathered against Israel. But what of this picture? Benjamin Netanyahu and Vladimir Putin they look like they're having a bit of a friendly, good mates, are they? Interesting expressions on their faces. Well, that was taken in Moscow last Wednesday. And Benjamin Netanyahu and Vladimir Putin seem to get on. But I'll just tell you one thing. After Ezekiel 37 comes Ezekiel 38. And that tells us that the great power that's going to intervene badly for Israel is the power of Russia and Europe. You can come and ask me about that afterwards. But Putin is not their mate. You know, they look and worry about Syria and Benjamin Netanyahu worries about Iran. But their big problem, according to the scriptures, is Russia. And that problem is not going away. Well, how will it all end up? It will end up. The Bible is not a book of war. Jesus came as the Prince of Peace. He is described in the Scriptures. And so the Bible talks about Jerusalem as the focus of world peace. Micah says that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be in the top of the mountains. It shall be lifted up. Jerusalem will be lifted up. And people shall flow to it. 
And this prophet Mike has just described how Jerusalem's going to be ruined. He says, oh yeah, Jerusalem will be ruined, but one day it's going to be lifted up and people will flow to Jerusalem. Many nations shall come and say, well, let's go up to the Mount of the Lord. We'll go to a house, God's house, in Jerusalem. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in God's paths. For out of Zion, from Jerusalem, another name for Jerusalem, the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be the center of God's purpose. Christ will claim it as king, and his word will go forth. The word of truth and peace, which Jesus taught. So I want to finish with a picture, not of Donald Trump's embassy in Jerusalem, but Christ's embassy in Jerusalem. I think it's slightly grander than Donald's. I know it's going to be much grander than the USA embassy. And I know it's not going to be a place of conflict. It's going to be a place of peace. For the Bible describes how all kings will go to meet the king of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jerusalem. And Psalm 72 describes how they will bow down before him. Now I want to leave you tonight with some words of Jesus from Luke chapter 21. Just before Jesus died, he gave an amazing prophecy of the things that would happen in the future. He was sitting right near Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. He was looking across to their present great temple where they worshipped God. And he says in verse 20, you know, says Jesus, your magnificent temple is about to be destroyed. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation is near. And then you should flee, said Jesus. Get out. Verse 22, these are the days of vengeance. And the Jews, he said in verse 24, will fall by the edge of the sword, be led away captive to all nations. Jesus said the Jewish people would be scattered into all the nations of the world. And Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And if you want to head up the history of Jerusalem from the days of Jesus right through to our days, Jesus sums it up. This city would be trampled by the Gentiles. That's exactly what's happened. Whether it's been the Crusaders or the Muslim invasions, it's been trampled by the Gentiles. But Jesus said, one day, Jerusalem will be taken out of the hands of the Gentiles. It will not be the capital of a Palestinian state, nor will it be the capital of a secular nation called the nation of Israel with a secular prime minister called Benjamin Netanyahu. No, there will be a time of conflict. Jesus calls it in verse 25 of Luke 21 a day of distress of nations where there's no way out and men's hearts would fail for fear. Jesus said, look, when things get really bad, don't worry because I'm coming. Verse 27 of Luke 21, you will see me, the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven. Lift up your head and rejoice. And he gave him something to watch. Jesus said, I want to tell you about a fig tree. You are like figs? Some of us like figs. When you see a fig tree blossoming, you know, said Jesus, that summer's on its way. Well, in the Old Testament, the fig tree was a symbol of God's nation, Israel. I saw your fathers like the first ripe fruit figs in the wilderness, said God through the prophet Hosea. Okay, so when you see a fig tree... The people of Israel shooting forth, says Jesus. When it's budding, verse 31, we have Jesus' words recorded, know that the kingdom of God is near. 70 years ago, the 
Prime Minister of Israel, stood up, David Ben-Gurion, and proclaimed the state of Israel. What should we be saying? Hey, God's kingdom is near. Are Christadelphians celebrating? Absolutely. Because Jesus said when we saw signs in the nation of Israel, we should be lifting up our heads and celebrating. Not celebrating the birth of a Jewish state, but celebrating because Christ is coming. But he says, take heed, watch, be ready, I'm coming. Jesus told us to watch Israel. I'm asking you, ladies and gentlemen, to watch Israel. These are God's people. This is his plan. The kingdom of God is coming. And we can all be there with the great king to celebrate the release of Jerusalem and the glory of God's name. What a fantastic hope is in the gospel if we just seize it for ourselves. Please stay around. We'd really love to talk to you afterwards.